Ads had to cut like a shitload of weight for the Vegas Wait, comp. We, yeah, we're going. Yeah, we are. Okay. Sweet. We'll do a little intro in a sec, but I'll just tell this little piece. And uh, you, you, you lost a bunch. You starved yourself and lost a bunch of weight. Right. And then you basically you guys saw just it. You guys saw it when I was coming in, like back. doing like I don't know, like 600 calories a day, training twice a day. It was rough. I did like a bit of a green of tinge. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was hard, man. How I think I lost like I don't know because I was cutting really aggressively. I was trying to make middle heavy, which is 88 in the gi, so I needed to get to 86. Oh, my God. And then I like to be two kilos under the day before fighting. So I would have wanted to get to 84. And at the start, I was I think I was like 96 or 97 or something like that. Have you cut to that weight before? Yeah, I used to always fight at that weight. Oh, wow. But when I was like, you know, mid-20s, um, early, yeah, mid-20s. Not a father. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not a dad running a business and, you know, and teaching full-time and all that. So I got, I don't know how many weeks in, like, Two or three weeks. No, maybe more like three weeks in. And I was just like, nah, I'm going to go heavyweight, which is 95 kilos. Yeah. Um, and then I, which I still, and so like I chilled on the diet and then chilled a little too much on the diet. And got, to, <laughs> got to Vegas and was like, oh, shit. You know, I still need to cut some weight. And like I landed in Vegas. Because what, what's the, the top of the, like what's the top, what's the restriction? 95.3. Right, that's the max yeah. for heavyweight. Yeah. Um, and then, so I got there, landed at like nine in the morning and like went for a run mm. and it was like 36 degrees already. And then I was like, Oh, just go around the block. And the, the block's a massive bro. And mm. before I know it, I'm like running down the strip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did I get here? You know? And there's like casinos and everything. And I'm like, fuck. And then, um, people thought it was Stefan Struve. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the UFC guy. <laughs> how, how many days was it until the fight? Like when after you landed? Uh, three days. Three days. That's pretty and rough, then, isn't it? But then, and then it was like such a big commotion because then, like, there was a dodgy little scale in the um, in the apartment, the the hotel gym. And then, so I'd been using that to check my weight, and then, like, one day before. Uh, this lady was like, oh, that scale's broken. See the crack in the side of it? So then you would stand on it and like it would bow out. And then I was like, oh, fuck. So like <laughs> I didn't know, like I was like, I don't know what I weigh. So then I like went for a mission to another hotel to like ask if I could use their scale. And I ran into some Brazilian in the corridor. And, um, and he was like, yeah, bro, I've got a scale in my room. Come up. I was like, oh, legend. So I like went up to his room and checked my weight and I was all good. And then when I weighed in, on the day, I was like four kilos under. I was like 91. Fuck, you know? damn it. So I was like, <laughs> yeah. But you never know. Like, you know, it's always better safe than sorry. Because, like, even if you check yourself on a scale, well, it's not the scale you weigh in on. And they It's don't, always a difference, eh? Hey? Yeah. And, I mean, because I was fighting on the first day, uh, like, you, you can't access any of the scales. Like, if you were fighting on day two or day three, mm. you would already be at the event. Mm. And at some stage when you're in the event, you could go and jump on the test scale. So you would have an idea. Do they use but the sliding scales? No, nah, no, nah, it's all like digital Digi. ones. Yeah, like yeah. all through a computer and everything. Um, yeah, so like I, I couldn't test. Actually, no, even worse than that, like the day, uh, the day before, because of the work I was doing for Alliance, like I kind of had access to some areas that other people didn't. So I sort of like, got into somewhere and started like jumping on the scale and one of the IBJJF dudes like, oh, man, bro, you can't check your weight yet. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, but I'm just working here. And he's yeah, like, like, it's nah, cool, man. man, I know the Brazilians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, bro, it's not calibrated yet. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so like, it was like null and void. Um, but yeah, like I said, ended up like, yeah, four, I think, yeah, 91, I believe I was. So it might have even been 90.5, but I was well, well underweight when I weighed in. And now you've blown back out. Yeah, well, I haven't even checked, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Yeah, we can yeah. weigh you after this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you have to start taking bets. Yeah. <laughs> All right away. I'd definitely be, I reckon, like in the, in the gi for sure, I'd be back up 95 or more easy. Because even, like, even when I cut weight, like I just ditch like carbs altogether. You know? So heaps of it's just it's like two or three kilos of water weight instantly, right? So I would, yeah, but for sure be back. Up to ninety five, or more, guys. Um, we got uh, we got Adam Childs in the house today. Uh, it's episode thirty eight. 
Correct. Jungle Brothers podcast. Uh, you guys know where to get us at, junglebrothers.com, if you want to get in touch. Um, but this episode's super cool. We got, uh, we got Ads here. He's my coach, my jiu-jitsu coach, and uh, he trains down here with us sometimes. And, um, yeah, we're going to sort of go on this journey of, of the, the jiu-jitsu piece and, and his life and having dedicated well, a large chunk of your adult life to the art. And, uh, man, thanks for being with us today. Man, awesome. Stoked to be on my first podcast. Fuck Never. yeah, bro. Feels so, like, professional. It is. Yeah. It's highly professional, yeah. like everything we do here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mate, Tom, can you, can you give us a little intro just who you are and uh, um, how you found yourself here? Who are you? Who, yeah. <laughs> Let's get deep right from yeah, question yeah, one. Yeah. Um, no, so yeah. Uh, so currently now, like I, I run, like Joey said, um, Joey trains with me at Alliance Sydney, which is in Rose Bay. So that's mine and my wife's gym. Um, I, yeah, spent most of my adult life in, in, in Brazil. Like I, I didn't have any uni degree or anything like and I made jiu-jitsu my university so I first left Australia and I actually went to Canada first and that's where I, I fully fell in love with jiu-jitsu and then like I, I just packed up everything and moved to Brazil to train with uh, Fabio Grogel the, the head of Alliance um, at the the Alliance headquarters there and I just jumped straight in the deep end um, I spent five years there training every day competing all the time, uh, started teaching by the time I left. And then uh, in 2016, I think it was, I moved back to Australia to, to open the gym here and took a little while to get things happening because, like, after five years in Brazil, like, I had to, like, move my whole life over here. I brought my wife, yeah. I brought my dog from Brazil, like, everything. And, like, my, my family doesn't live in Sydney. I remember when I first got back here, I was like oh, yeah, I'll just have whatever for dinner. And I was like, oh, I don't have any spoons. Like, you know, like <laughs> nothing, you know, like... You Start did, again. Yeah, like from scratch. So it took a little while to, you know, save the capital and everything. But now we've been open for um, uh, a year and three months. Opened in August last year. And uh, just creating monsters like Joey, you know, getting staunch, rolling around on the ground with sweaty men, sometimes sweaty women, you know. Sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> sweaty. Always, it's always sweaty. <laughs> what, um, what was before that as a kid and, and like where did you grow up and what were you – have you been a lifelong <laughs> martial artist? Were you playing a different sport? What was your thing as a kid? Yeah, kind of. I mean like I've always been active. Like I grew up in, in, in Byron and not like in the city of Byron but just outside of Byron. And like so I grew up with like on a, on a farm with horses and – dogs and motorbikes and everything uh so i've always been active like did the classic little kid thing my parents put me into like playing little rugby league and all that sort of stuff and i did all the athletics carnivals and mm. and again growing up in byron like heaps of swimming and surfing and all that sort of stuff um so i've always been like outdoorsy and active but i didn't really get into like martial arts until I was maybe 16 and back then like I didn't know what jiu-jitsu was I'd never heard of it or anything um so I started this martial art called Hapkido which is more or less really just one of those martial arts that's about the art and the the form you know it's not Paul Sun's in there right now Kind of, kind right. of. Oh Point yeah. Off shoot. He's what, doing he's a Korean. Ha- what is it? It's a Japanese. Japanese. Uh, no, it's Korean. Korean. Yeah. Korean. He's doing Han Mudo. Is it like a throwing one? Yeah, I yes. mean, Hapkido claims they, they kind of do a bit of everything. Some like cool kicks. Punching and kicking. Yeah, I got like, you know, cool big outfits. influence. Yeah, cool outfits, yeah. <laughs> big influences from Taekwondo for their kicks and uh, they've got some throws and stuff. Mm. But, um, you know, like, it's really not a system of, of fighting. Like, I guess to a degree, like, the self-defense aspect works and like any self-defense, it's really based to work against someone who doesn't know what they're doing, you know? Like... Yeah, uh, or wants to hold your wrist. Yeah. Stand still. Well, actually, do you know? Do you know? <laughs> do you know where that comes from? The holding wrist What's techniques. The deal? So that um, the wrist. wrist watch. Yeah, yeah, wrist yeah, watch yeah, yeah. Trying to lift someone's watch. <laughs> yeah. No. So it comes from um, the reason that a lot of like those self-defense uh. techniques come from holding a wrist and then being like watcha and getting out of it come from like 
uh, back in the days of samurais, you would grab their wrists so they couldn't draw their sword. Oh, oh that's awesome. Yeah. That's way more gangster. Yeah. So, I mean, it has a, a foundation, right? Yes. And that actually reminds me of another really cool... Symbolic like, re- re- rebellion. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> um, another random fact I really like is... Tell us, please. ...why we, in uh, predominantly like uh, Commonwealth countries, we drive on the left... Instead of the right. Do you know this one, Joey? I, told I don't you know this if one? I do. I just think it's cool that you're going into this. <laughs> <laughs> <Tell me. laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> this sword used to be on one hip. <laughs> no, you're kind, you're kind of right. Yeah. So, Gun. you know, back, back when you had like, you know, kings and queens and castles and knights and everything, if you were a knight, Walking along on your horse, I would have been. And a you, uh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, you sh- I'd have been one. a peasant. <laughs> 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 no, no black knight. <laughs> black knight. Yeah, yeah. I was the <laughs> only one. Yeah. Um, I'll so be that guy that collects poo. <laughs> <laughs> Any scraps, sir? Any scraps, sir? <laughs> oh. Yeah, but um, so it was if you passed like a, another knight walking in the other direction on his horse, like, you would draw your sword and it would be on the side to, like, fight him. Huh. You yeah. know? So he would pass on so your right, because most people are right-handed. right-handed. Right. And then that trickled down to us passing the same driving way, the driving, right? So what cool. happened to America and stuff like that? I mean, there's lots that happen. <laughs> lots of America. Left-handers? You know, <laughs> left-handers. Of special yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the States and in Europe. So. Yeah. Um, Sounds anyway, a bit paranoid so though, doesn't it? When you think about it, yeah, it's a bit like of the, a yeah. uh, constantly get, want to just draw the sword and. But I guess that was the yeah, fight. That, was, uh, yeah, that was what I mean, it was like for most of our existence, right? Yeah. Like I mean, you any, like any that, stranger you know? passing by, you're like, "Who's this fucking oh, guy?" Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me stab you in the face, bro. Have you, seen, have, you, have you seen that video of the, the guy on the elliptical? With the, this is like another little YouTube video. A guy's like on an elliptical in a gym and he's yeah. got a sword. And he's, like, he's like running on an elliptical, practicing stabbing people. Oh, oh. <laughs> that go down well. He likes board games too, yeah. that guy, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good job for the gym instructor. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, anyway, so I did... Hap Keto, that's where like I started. And and yeah, like like a lot of martial arts, it's really just the, the art. And the and discipline. The discipline. And, and the practice. For, I mean, and for kids, it's super great. So like, good for kids. I actually tell a lot of parents, like, you know, I say, look, jujitsu is great because they learn a bit more like uh, like physical realism. You know, they actually get to wrestle and stuff. But at the end of the day, if you look, look looking at little kids, man, it's not about learning how to fight. It's, uh, you know... Uh, s- s- confidence and their self-esteem and coordination and teamwork and social skills and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah. So I but mean, you can still get that with the martial arts that work. No, no, that's that's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 hundred percent. Right. Yeah. You know what? I, I've like my my kid's been doing this art for over a year now. He just mm-hmm. got his green belt. You know, the belts come every kind of twelve weeks or, or not or even, whatever it not is. even. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, like I'm trying to groom him to come <laughs> come and do like uh, jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu or yeah. taekwondo or something like that. Yeah. Um, but this is great. It's around the corner from our house. Discipline, black belt, behavior and stuff like that that they promote. It's great. Right? Yeah. I want him. I'm trying to get him to come across. But I've got like, uh, do you know McDojo? <laughs> yeah. Respectfully. Yeah. I, I, I laugh all the time because I see the McDojo things, the Instagram account, um, which has... Bogus martial arts videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah for anyone who has the ones know. where the dudes just wave their hand and the yeah, people, people are like, oh, backward. have yeah. a have like an epileptic yes. fit on the yeah, ground. It's yeah. the no touch technique. Yeah, yeah, grab yeah. the wrist and then they flip. Yeah. So anyway, I I'm always. Stuff. I know it's funny. It's funny, but I, I think it's so <laughs> hilarious, and I'm always like nagging my wife that we've got to pull him out because they're indoctrinating him to be that person yeah, when he grows right, up. Right. So I just tag her in the <laughs> McDojo videos all the time. So this is Wyclef. This is how he's going to be soon. You know, he's going to become a teenager and have this false idea. Yeah. Um, but to, I mean, you're going to, that sort of situation of like trying to remove your kid into a different sport or activity. Uh, I did a course while I was in Vegas with uh, a guy who works in... Uh, like kids learning development and kids psychology and all that sort of stuff. And it's something like, I mean, look, I can't remember. I'm just sort of trying to recall off the top of my head, but it's something like, uh, I think 75% of a kid's decision like is influenced by uh, 
essentially the environment that they're in. Or in other words, like if they do this particular martial art because their friends do it, they're not going to leave. You know, like it doesn't matter. Like you can't tempt them with like this is better or this will get you medals or this will get you this. Like if their friends do it, like that's... You can't will, fight that. You, yeah, sure. that'll be 75% towards yeah. the kid's decision mm. and their, their want to do it. It's like the gym it. here. It's you like the gym here. You want to play. You want to have fun with yeah. people. I mean, people how, come how, here. They how stay for is, the community how, how here. And it's a social standing too, isn't it? Because if you... Because it's also like... Like I think the kids get... Like you, you learn that from a real young age. It's like, well, if I want to be in with this group and, I, you know, and equal... Yeah, that's your coffee, bro. Um, that's for the coffee? That's for the coffee, man. Um, then to, to keep doing that thing is keeping you keeping your place in that sort of in that system, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, like you know, if you're already a green belt there, like you're, well, you're someone there. That's you right. Know, you move to jujitsu. You're just another white belt, bro. Well, yeah, I know. That, that, but that's why <laughs> I'm don't, trying to. But I didn't mention before. Don't say just another white belt because there is a white belt at this table. Oh, <laughs> longest reigning white belt. <laughs> <this evening>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. He's but five. How, how, he's five. five. Yeah. 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 So man, they're giving him belts all the time, so he feels that they're, they're trying to, like I said, indoctrinate him. But they into do. That. But I mean, jujitsu gyms do that <laughs> too, do eh? Too. Like they just give like uh, stripes and belts and whatever really early or really quickly to yep. like buy the longevity of their yep. their student. Right? It happens all the time. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine because they they I mean they believe and they are doing something good for the kid. Mm. That's yeah. super healthy for him and his development. So they they want him to keep it up, and yeah, for sure. Sometimes that's a, important as well to be giving lots of rewards at the beginning, even for adults, yeah. uh, until you can build the discipline to but to hang out a little longer. Yeah, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because the kids, what's that? Uh, I can't remember that famous uh, experiment. Where kids the were marshmallow, given, marshmallow yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yep. given <laughs> one <laughs> now or video. three later, <laughs> two later, or whatever it is. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, I'd hate to do that on my kids. I'd be so disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it pre- it I'd be pull them out of the life, bag before it? they even <laughs> got to the table, <laughs> like <to> little seagulls. <laughs> I've tried. I've tried it on my kids. I've tried it. Oh, have you? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. doesn't work. Like, yeah. I tried. It. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Have That's, you seen? Have it's you seen a sick video. If anyone listening hasn't seen it, it's. You could put it the, the kids' marshmallow test in YouTube and it would come up. But yeah, they sit them down and they Did, tell them if you don't eat yet. this marshmallow that's in front of you and you can last 10 minutes or whatever, yeah. we will give you a second marshmallow. Yeah, yeah. And then it's just, you're just watching highlights of these kids just trying like, to resist the urge. Yeah. Have, have you seen, there was, a, um, there was a show on Netflix. I don't know if it's still on there. It's like a, a ma- magician show, but it's like really cool, sort of like, it's like humorous. And he... Uh, he does that experiment with these kids, <laughs> but um, he's in the room as well with the kids. Like, he's a participant, you know, so they both have a marshmallow in front of him and he just does, like, heaps of hilarious stuff where he just, like, he'll, like, he'll eat the marshmallow and then he just, like, keeps, like, regurgitating, like, hundreds of marshmallows and the kids just sitting across, like, <gasps> <laughs> you know, or, like, you know, he'll take the kid's marshmallow and, like, put it under a cup and then lift the cup and the marshmallow's gone. And the kid's, like, <laughs> and then the other person comes back in the room and, the, and, like, the professor's, like, oh, you ate your marshmallow. And the kid's, like, wait, no. <laughs> it's, really, it's really funny. Um, I don't know how we started talking about marshmallows. but <laughs> I started a martial arts when I was... When I was five, when I was five, I think I started Taekwondo. Did it for six years. I was pretty good at it. Dude, that's decent. Yeah, six yeah, yeah. years yeah, yeah. at and that age. Yeah, yeah, I was fucking religious. Uh, I still wasn't very flexible. Got to my, I was just off getting to a red belt. And then I got a fight, into a fight with one of the kids from my football team. who was the, um, the halfback, smallest kid in the team. Quite aggressive though. And he was a boxer and he just lit me up. <laughs> he fucking bashed me oh, was in that front you, of... Your dad was watching? Yeah. Yep. He bashed oh, me in no. front of the whole team. And then he mounted me in a full mount and just, just punched me in the face. Oh, and Jesus. I had no answer. I was just lying there going, oh my God, I've got six years Don't of Taekwondo. Strike the head. Don't strike and the head. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's lying on me and I was like, that's it. No more Taekwondo. <laughs> yeah. Kick that so to you, the curb. You were like 10 or 11. Oh, like 12? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would have been, no, I would have been 10, mm. around 10, Ouch. 10, 11, yeah. That's oh. a yeah. harsh re- realisation it was. at such a young age. Yeah, and then I, what I, what I see uh, a year later, I think I watched the first 
I saw my first K1 and I was like, that's where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, mean, I, I didn't have... <laughs> Stan Longanides. <laughs> I didn't have quite the traumatic experience, but it was more or less like <laughs> the, the, the same result where like... Um, I understand T a lot yeah. more now. <laughs> the trauma still there. Um, where... Yeah, so like I, I mean, by the time I even got my black belt in Hapkido, I was already a bit like, oh, I don't know about this thing. And then I went and did a Muay Thai class, and yeah, and I was like, oh, like this, <laughs> so this is real, you know. And then so I, I pretty much instantly stopped Hapkido and and just trained Muay Thai for a couple of years, and then. I was like, oh, I don't really like getting punched in the face. It's, <laughs> it's not the most fun I've had. I mean, it's just really hard, you know? Like, you have to be really... It's just hard. And then um, Chris, who's one of my students at the gym, who's a blue belt, he actually got me into jujitsu because he had trained a little bit and, like, so we would wrestle and stuff. And then I was like, oh, man, this is the best. I'll have to start it one day, but never had the time because I was preparing to move overseas. And then, what, what, uh, How old were you and, like, where were you at this point So I was when you in, did the Muay Thai? Uh, in, in Bondi. Okay, um, so you'd move from Byron down to Sydney. Yeah, so I moved to Sydney when I was 18. Okay. Um, there's not a lot happening in Byron. I mean, if you, if you don't want to... <laughs> yeah, there's, I've had a couple of good <laughs> mount mushies, bad mushies, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so they did I moved Muay Thai down here. when I was 18, yeah, 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 yeah uh, to get out of Byron. And so, yeah, I did Hapkido and Muay Thai down here. Yep. And then I wanted to start Jiu-Jitsu, but I just didn't have the time because I was preparing to move overseas. And then so I started in Canada is where I started. And then, yeah, I got so addicted, just didn't come back home and moved to Brazil. You know, Mad. just upped everything, found the... was like, man, I'm going to go to the best gym. And, you know, for people who don't know much about, like, Fabio and Alliance, like, Alliance, the team is been around for 25, 26 years now. This is its 26th year. Um, Fabio, my coach, is one of the founders of Alliance. And, you know, he's a four-time world champion himself. And for anyone who knows boxing and knows who Freddie Roach is... Fabio would be like the Freddie Roach of jiu-jitsu. Like he's created more world champions wow. than, than any other instructor. You know, if you just rattle off some of the big names in jiu-jitsu, like Marcelo Garcia, Cobrinha, Lucas Lepri, uh, Bernard Faria, like all these guys are, are students of Fabio's. And so he's, yeah, he's been a world champion himself. He's created an absurd amount of world champions. And he's also taken alliance to a total of 12 world titles which to give that some reference, the closest in second place has five world titles. Wow. wow. You know, That's so like a team world title. Yeah, a team world title. So you go to a comp and everyone competes and they kind of tally up all the medals type thing? Yeah, yep. so you get, um, you know, uh, at jiu-jitsu competitions, <laughs> you have first, second and two thirds. So the, the two bronze medalists don't fight. They just both um, uh, Get, get the medal. Yep, yep. So you get nine points for a gold medal, six for silver, and bronze get one point each. But you can only have um, two athletes per team, per division. So you can't just like swarm the competition with yeah, numbers yeah, that makes sense. and win, right? Yep. So if, if, there's a, if there's a division, let's say whatever it is, black belt, lightweight, and there's eight alliance students who have registered... Uh, beforehand we as in the Alliance Association which I work for as well as one of the managers of the team um, we have to go through the list of students and we have to pick we go okay out of those eight who yep. are the two guys that we think are going to medal yeah. you know and they'll go as team A and then the rest go as team B and then so if someone from team B makes it to the podium like those points don't count Oh toward, shit! You have to nominate our, them before the before the event starts. Yeah, yeah. So you <coughs> so you can't just like. So the pressure's on Team A. Yeah, yeah. So like sometimes like when you when you see that you've been registered as Team A, you're like, oh, fuck. man, coach believes in me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got to come through. Pressure. Yeah. Pressure starts. So um, what's the what's the deal? What what is like so? Brazilian Jiu Jitsu mm. is the martial art. Yeah. Then you've got. Alliance, which is one, it's not a different kind of jujitsu. No, or no, no. It's, it's, it's a yeah. So it's just a, the the team name, right? And that would have started in a gym somewhere in Brazil. Yeah. So I mean, like, it's still so 
my coach's coach, so Fabio's coach is a guy called Jacare, right? Not the the black Jacare from the UFC that most people know of. The Whitaker bashed. <laughs> yeah. Guy. So um, <clears throat> my coach's coach, Jacare, is like a much older guy and trained. His coach is a guy called Holes Gracie, you know, one of the old school Gracies. Um, so it, it eventually, you know, it came from Gracie, so to speak. And then what happened is there was Jacare, Fabio, and Gigi, who's uh, also one of um, Jacare's students. And they'd gone their separate ways, right? Like that, And they had their <coughs> own gyms. And they found that their students kept having to compete against each other in competitions. And they were like, oh, man, like... Fabio or Jacare was like, I don't want my student fighting Fabio's student. You know, we're, the, we're like, we're brothers, we're family, you know. So then they made the team alliance. And then, so now to this day, like, it's still those three guys running the team. And uh, and when you register to compete, you put the, your name's alliance and that's the team that you're essentially saying, I'm scoring points towards that team. And I mean, and nowadays, jiu-jitsu is so... Um, managed by the IBJJF, you have to have a team to, right. to compete under. You can't just, like, register and be like, oh, I'm just, like... I'm a guy. Um, yeah, I'm representing Solo. myself. Team yeah. Jungle Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jungle Brothers, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm. But, yeah, um, so you have to have a pre-approved team that you register under. It's also a way that the IBJJF, like, can, you know, guarantee exist. to us... Yeah, yeah, exist, but also guarantee to a certain extent that, um, you know that you are a jiu-jitsu competitor mm. and you're not just some dude. Crazy dude. Yeah, some crazy dude who's going to walk in and, like, start punching people, people and, yeah, slamming people and going against the yeah, rules and whatever. Important, it's important to have a regulation, I think, especially you in have, any combat. Yeah, sport. for sure. Like, yeah, definitely. Like, a sport where, yeah, a combat sport, you have to have someone looking after the, the competitors, right, mm. to a certain degree. So, but, so your, your jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but great, the Gracie family, um, they were the original, but you're not a, but the Alliance is not a Gracie, Gracie No, gym. so, I mean, so we have no uh, uh, affiliation to, to the Gracie family, right? Like, there's heaps of Gracie gyms. There's so lots like, of Gracie gyms out yeah, there. Yeah, so, like, Gracie Baja is another, like, team name. Gracie Humaita is another team name, right? And they're completely, um, like, they're, they're unrelated. They're unrelated, they're, despite, oh, they're not, despite, they're despite not, both having no, the, the name Gracie. they both have Gracie. that name in their name. But the, the family, <laughs> so the story goes that Maeda, this uh, Japanese guy, like, immigrated to Brazil and started teaching the, the Gracie family like jiu-jitsu and then the Gracie family developed like changed the Japanese jiu-jitsu techniques that required a lot of like strength and athleticism to Brazilian jiu-jitsu being more efficient based on leverage and yada 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 and then so you know you can speak to some people who argue Brazilian jiu-jitsu is Gracie jiu-jitsu but you know, like, yes, the, the Gracie family is super important and they did a lot for the growth of the sport. And they founded it? They founded it? Or uh, this guy did? I mean, I guess it depends who you ask, but, like, a, a, a good, you know, like, a lot of people, if you look at their lineage, at some stage connects to a Gracie, right? Mm -hmm. But... On the flip side, you've got like a very famous, like multiple time world champion, Rodolfo Vieira, who now fights in the UFC, um, retired from jiu jitsu competition. I believe maybe you'll do super fights, I don't know, but, um, but he doesn't compete like at the worlds every year anymore. But when he did, he was, he was a monster, right? And uh, if you look at his lineage, he doesn't have a single Gracie in his lin lineage. Like it goes all the way back to Maeda. Because this guy from Japan didn't only teach the Gracies. Right. He taught other people too. Ah, interesting. Right? So, you know, if you want to argue that uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, then you go, but Rodolfo Vieira is like a, whatever it is, like a five-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt world champion and doesn't have a single Gracie in his lineage. You know, um, perhaps that would have been different back in the day, but... Man, nowadays with like the internet and everything, right. like knowledge is just shared all over the place. Like, you know, you can learn Gracie techniques with never meeting a Gracie or you can learn a technique from me or that guy over there or whatever without never actually meeting them. I guess you've got to give them, <clears throat> I, I, I suppose, you, you, you know, that said, you have to give them credit for... You have for sure. You know, for bringing it to the world. For sure. They, which, did, they did heaps like the, the old school... Um, 
what were they called? Like the Gracie, Gracie challenges, I think. What so a way that they did to market jujitsu was they invited, you know, people from other martial arts into their gym to try and, you know, take totally. them on in essentially in like a no rules fight, right? And they were like this super old school footage. If you look at it, like awesome, um, it's, it's really it's videos. really cool, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and then obviously. Um, the the biggest explosion was was Hoist Gracie in the UFC just being like a super small dude. Hicks and Gracie as well did heaps of fights in Japan, um, in in uh, Pride and stuff like that. Yeah, and that obviously did heaps like huge amounts for the sport. So you can't deny their influence in the sport. But I mean, I personally don't get too involved in like oh. Who created this and who did that and whatever? Like, man, you know, it's all hearsay. Like, doesn't it doesn't matter? It's just shared knowledge, right? Like, yes, they for sure did huge things for it, but you know, if they didn't do it, was someone else going to do it? I don't know. Maybe, right? It's the same with with any sort of uh, inventions or advancements in anything. Like, if you go, oh, the Wright brothers invented flying or something, it's like, yeah, for sure, you give them heaps of credit, but if they didn't. I would say a good chance that someone else was going to come along and do it, you know? Like, mm -hmm. so, like, yeah, you can say if it wasn't for the Wright brothers, you go, well, if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't have happened in that year, but I'm sure it would have happened some mm -hmm. other way mm -hmm. at some stage. It's funny too with jujitsu, right? Because it, um, it now, like, the techniques that are used, like, uh, uh, like it, it's now at a point where it, it has its own techniques that are evolving around the rules of the sport. Yeah. But a lot of what's going on, you can see in old textbooks from judo or Japanese jiu-jitsu. Yeah. And it now incorporates re like catch wrestling and yeah. like any type of wrestling, any kind of grappling art gets incorporated into it, doesn't it? So it's... I, I, I actually find it like mind-boggling how diverse it is and how that we haven't yet figured out everything you can do with your body and to someone else's body. And then you add into it the gi as well, which is like a whole nother layer. You know, like no gi is already technical enough, right? It's super technical. And then you add in like a whole nother like tool, a gi with grips and stuff that all this other stuff you can do. It goes on forever. Hey? Like how is there still <clears throat> stuff being invented? You know, yeah, like it's, 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 it's crazy dynamic, right? You would think there's only so many ways that you can like choke someone out or you know sweep them or whatever, but no, it just keeps going and going. Like F it's, it's like how I come up with fresh shit for our newsletter every Friday. <laughs> I'm like, it's been fucking three, four years, man. I'm still coming up with new shit. How? It's we. I thought we reached peak newsletter, but uh, not. Um, it's yeah, true. For, it? for people that don't that don't know, the, the gi is the uniform, right? It's the kimono. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. big, heavy cotton thing, and. You can grip it, you can grab it, and you can, you can, so you got hand, so you know, your opponent has handles all over them essentially, but then you can also use your gear to wrap around them and choke them with it. And so it is kind of the possibilities in, in that as you know, in that perspective are kind of endless. Yeah. And I really like the gear. Like, I, I really enjoy training in the gear. Like, it's, I don't know. Yeah. It's just like a whole nother tool, a whole nother layer of, of um, control. And in the beginning, it can be a bit frustrating because you're like, people are holding onto your sleeves and collars and you're just mm. like, bro, ah, fuck, let go. Like, it's super frustrating. But then, like, you learn, oh, but I can hold them too. Mm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is not just one way. And it becomes super fun, you know? And creative, yeah. Super creative. Yeah. And it's also a great, like, uh, I think it's also really beginner friendly because it allows you. Like, no gear can be super scrambly and slippery and, you know, you need sometimes required to be really athletic and quick and explosive. And no gear kind of allows you to sort of slow it down and, you know, even if you're a bit lost, you don't know what to do, you can just hold on to something. And it soaks up a bit of the sweat too. So when much. When you begin, oh, cleans it up a Joe, little Joe, bit. Joey and I trained last night, no gi, and at the end I just said, bro, no gi is just so gross. Like it's just <laughs> sweat everywhere. I can feel you all over yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gi definitely like... It's soaked into my skin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we are one. Yeah. Um, but I really like it. I, I really like gi. It's heaps of fun. We just switched to the gi here at JB's and, uh, and yeah, the feedback from everyone, like because we've been doing a year of just no gi, and uh, the feedback from everyone is, well, there's little bits of frustration, like, oh, I don't know how to do this, and this has changed and whatever, but largely I think people are finding it more uh, intellectually engaging 
100%. because because yeah. it's just opened up like all this new shit. Yeah, yeah. You know? And and also I noticed that there's more beginners now who are finding the idea of trying a class more appealing. Yeah. Because it does look less intimidating. You got that protective layer on. Yeah, and you can see that it's you like can in your see pajamas. The, you can see the yeah, technicality. Yeah, pajamas. <laughs> yeah. Whereas in yeah. Nogi, I think it can when be hard. For yeah. the untrained eye to see the technicality, it just looks for like sure. and two you also, people trying to mash each other. And you also don't know, like, if, you, if you're new and you walk in to a no-gi class and, like, you have no sort of, like, visual indicator of your opponent's, like, skill in the There's sense no that... Belt. Yeah, you don't know what he is, right? And then, you know, maybe he smashes you or not. Whereas when you see someone else with a, a white belt, if you're new, you can instantly relate to them. You know, you're like, hey... I'm shit too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then, and then, I don't mean that. I'm talking to you, team. And you slap hands with Tior and he just fucking destroys you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> we got to get wife belt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, it's definitely, uh, I, I would agree, a little less intimidating. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's also just part of the sport, you know? Like the sport has gi. And yes, there's a whole other branch of... Of, of no gi but unless the, the governing body like IBJJF makes some definitive like oh you don't need to train in the gi to earn belts or whatever like well I mean you have to train in the gi if you want to progress in the sport at least from a rank point of view and most people do you know yeah like you get com- people who are just through and through competitors they often like don't care right they're just like oh well I just want to like smash and win and compete but the average person isn't a competitor. Like the research shows that only uh, anywhere from like 2%, maybe maximum 5% of your students will be competitors, you know? Um, and it's actually where a lot of gyms go wrong. They, they want to have the, the toughest dudes in their gym so they market their gym as being the best competitor gym. But from a business point of view, bro, your business model is targeted at 2% mm. of your, of your yep. of potential what you clients, can, of your potential clients, right? And they gotta, those top competitors have to, have to come from somewhere. Like you got to yeah. have that, that place to start. Yeah, and even worse than that, Competitors like a bums. They don't yeah, have any exactly. money. They don't want to pay. Like they just want everything for free because they feel like you know they're doing you a favor by, you know. So it's just the wrong way to to, to go about it. Going back to the sport, what are the rules in competition? Because I've actually competed in a jujitsu comp once. Did you? Yeah, I thought I thought I felt I, th- tea, I thought man. I won. Did he get DQ'd? I, it's I, like I, revenge for that. Mo- <laughs> that mo- I totally thought I won. Revenge for that. Now. that, that no, I, rugby I kid that yeah. mount. <laughs> Had a flashback. I used the <laughs> soccer kick technique. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it would have been about fifteen years ago. It was. This was back in the day when, like, the there was a bit no there was gi and no gi. This one was no gi. And they and you just turn up in t-shirts and board shorts. Who were you training? You were training with some savages back that then. That was uh, in um, at Maroubra. Um, Lifesaver Club. Was that with Life Saving Club? Was that the old Gracie gym there? Yeah. Was yep. that just like a bunch of lifesavers who wanted to beat the crap yeah, out of people? Yeah, it's pretty, 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 pr- it was, it's pretty, um, there was a lot of big dudes there. A lot of bra boys, wasn't it? Yeah, mostly bra boys, but they, they were really nice. Was, um, but yeah, I just remember that one, you, one, one of you would have to take t shirt off. And the other one had to keep the t-shirt on. Yeah, right. And it wasn't like, it was just school. a t-shirt. Like, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I lost. And I totally thought that I won yeah, when I right. did it. And then um, I didn't know the rules, though. Were well, people waving it? money while you were doing <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was there yeah. people yeah. straight yeah. after you? Oh. Was there a big tub of jelly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, Jason Ro- Rosser. Jason, yeah. Jason. Jason was there, and I used to kickbox with him before jiu-jitsu. Shout out, Jace Gracie Parramatta. Yeah, we were both white belts at the time, and he was there as well. And I was like, I was doing something. I don't know what I was fucking doing. I didn't know what I was doing. And, he, and he's yelling out to me. He's like, D, you're down on points. Come on, you got you to fucking sweep him or something like that. And then I was like, oh, man. He fired me up. And then I, the next time I saw him was like 10 years later, uh, or 15 years later maybe. And he was a black belt, and I was, and I'd gone back to jiu-jitsu as a white belt, and he looked, and he's like, "Oh man, you're looking good." He's like, "Yeah," and he goes, "Oh, man, you're still a white belt," and I'm like, "Yeah," and he goes, "Oh, bro, bro, you, man, I remember back in the day, man, if you kept going, you'd be, you'd be black belt by now." Oh, he was a purple belt. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be black belt by now, and I was like, "Oh, heart sank." Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's so good. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know. I would, I would assume that the rules back then were different to how they are now. Um, but yeah, like, you know, yeah, it's just a, a point scoring system, right? Depending on the on the the position. Uh, I mean, it can get a little confusing because it is such a dynamic sport. But essentially, like the the very basic point system is you get two points for a takedown, three points for a guard pass, two points for knee on belly, four points for mount, and four points for back control. Right? And so if the time runs out and there's no uh, submission, then it's whoever has the most points. But, um, yeah, it does get super confusing because you can get advantages, you can get penalties, and, you know, and sometimes you can be like, oh, w- was oh, and two points for a sweep, sorry, as well. And like, oh, was that control? a sweep? No, so you don't get points for side control. You'd get points for passing the guard. So if I take you down and yeah. land straight in side control, yeah. I only get two points for, for the, the takedown because yeah. I didn't pass your guard, right? So the position mm-hmm. side control doesn't award points. A guard pass award points. But would something you, like mount, have, I see, I see, yeah. mount, the position awards points. So if I take you down and land in mount, I get two points for the takedown plus four points for mount. Ooh, so I get good. six points. Right, and just good. fucking stall, stall. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for that time to run out. Yeah. Bro, just you're ride up, that cowboy. You're up on points. There's only nine minutes to go. <laughs> stall. Hold it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, then yeah, like so you can get um, yeah ad- advantages and yeah penalties for for stalling or penalties for making incorrect grips or you know and there's some like positions you're not allowed to do certain techniques you can only do for certain belts and stuff. And this is all. Keep in mind, like, I'm talking about IBJJF rules. There's plenty okay, of competitions that, like, ADCC, for example, has a whole different rule set, you know? But um, That's this weekend, hey? This uh, weekend, hey? Th- next weekend, I believe. Yeah. Or maybe it's this I weekend. I think it's this. Is it this weekend? Yeah. you confused. What, how do you, <coughs> when you get a position, how do they know you've gotten it? Like, do you have to hold it for, for three, two sec- three, three, three seconds? seconds okay. Yeah, to stabilise. So yeah. if, you know, if I pass your guard... And then I'm in side control. Yeah, never. never. <laughs> and, and then I'm in side control for two seconds and you regard, I would get an advantage for almost passing almost. your guard. Okay. So advantages kick in when the points are tied, then it's who had the most advantages. Okay. And then yep. if the advantages are tied, it's like, oh well, points are tied or advantages are tied, but I got a penalty for whatever okay. and you, so doing something wrong, you would win. And then if everything's tied across the rock, board. Scissors, paper. Yeah, rock, scissors, paper. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, so put most of your time into stalling and getting good at rock, paper, scissor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> take you, take you <laughs> yeah, no, it's just judge's decision. That's a Tim right. Ferriss way. Oh, it doesn't of like go over time? No. So, I mean, again, some competitions, some of those like um, uh, events like EBI mm-hmm. and stuff have, uh, yeah, different rule sets. Like EBI has that one that in overtime you then like start on the person's back. It sounds so exciting, all those new comps. I like. Uh, those one-off events, like as, yeah, a, as cool. a fan, I haven't been to one. You went to one last weekend, yeah. Yeah, I like, went and watched one in Sydney. Yeah, so sub, 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 subversion, to to subversion. Like yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, it was great. Uh, you know, the, it, bulletproof um, homie Joel, bulletproof homie win. Joel and Mikhail and Mikhail. Yeah, the yep. main and the co-main event, and then the the other co-main event was Jake uh, Driscoll from Perth. Another black belt who's just joined Bulletproof. Oh, as well. that was that guy saying uh, he wants you guys to go over. Was that that guy yeah. you're telling me? Yeah, yeah he yeah, wants yeah. to get us over for a seminar. Yeah, but uh, yeah, they uh, Jake didn't win. It was a ref's decision. Went to the other guy, and then Mikhail and Joel both won. Um, interestingly, it was their black belt debut as well. It was Joel's first black belt gi match in yeah, competition, right. and Mikhail's first black belt match. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, those events are getting more and more popular. And I, I, I mean, what I liked about last weekend was that. There was, it, was at, it was in the evening, that was one. It was kind of like a nighttime thing. Yeah. And they had like walkout music and like smoke machines and shit. He said and they had a bar as well. They had well, a bar. Right? So yeah. you could, yeah, Makes you could a big difference. Have some yeah. drinks, get a burger, <laughs> whatever. It was, and it was kind of... Because typically jiu-jitsu is like you go to a comp, it's on a weekend, it's during the day, it's at a, a tennis court, like yeah. a sports hall. Yeah. And it's kind of... It's great, but they're not... Uh, they're not events. No, yeah. they it's don't not have like, food vendors. Yeah. You don't go there to hang out. You go there if you're usually competing... Or if you're going to watch someone do their thing, but this is a kind of cool social thing, and I, I, I like how it's, it's giving more variation or more of an offering to how people can get to know the sport. Yeah, and it's just growing the popularity of it. Is it professionalizing? Like, do they can you make a bit of money as a competitor yet, or not? Not doesn't quite have the. 
There's some okay market, prize yeah. money for some of these yeah, kind some, of no gear guys. Some of right? these events have prize money. Like they had um, couldn't at the make mar- a living off of nah. that. No, not yet. Not not solely from competing. Like if you look at um, there was just the the heavyweight GP that was in Vegas while I was over there, and the winner of that uh, cyborg won forty k for winning, um, and second place was ten thousand dollars. But like in terms of like regular IBJJF competitions, you get nothing, right? Like you win the Black Belt World Championships, like it costs you money to register. Like well, you don't even yeah. get your entry fee back. The f- but what you are going to get is when you like win something like that, you're going to, b- by the time you've stepped down on the podium, your Instagram's going to be full of people wanting to, to book seminars with you and stuff. And these guys charge like anywhere. A couple of thousand? Oh yeah, like minimum like three grand. Like okay. they're charging like, four or five six thousand dollars for like a couple of hour seminar you know so um if you you don't sometimes you don't even have to win right you just have to like become known and like you're then really well against someone that's known or exactly or do well against someone yeah Yeah. or beat be an underdog and beat one of those guys even if it's just in the first round and then you lose your next one but like you take out a top-notch competitor or something bro you're going to be getting book seminars and you might just spend a year Traveling yep. around, like, you know, if you do like 20, 30 seminars, 5K a pop, like, you make a lot of money. But Plus, you get some sponsorships, some like, yeah, things sponsorships, for, you yeah. get like your free geese and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, it's also very, uh, the jiu jitsu community is very, like, now. And what I mean by that is, like, you could have, like, a dude who's a 10 time world champion. But he's been around for a while because he's a 10-time world champion. But, like, he's like, oh, the the greatest of all time. And then you've got that guy next to him who just won last year. So he's, like, more current, so to speak. People will go to his seminar. Who's trending. Yeah, who's trending, right? Instead of the (laughs) multiple... And it's like, yeah, but, bro, that dude won last year too. And the nine years before, Yes. right? Like, it's very sort of, like, catchy. It's like, who's hot now, you know? So really, like... In long term, you, you need to, I, I believe, you need to teach. Like you need to have um, like your own gym to make money in yep, jiu-jitsu yep. or something else like some other sort of, uh, I don't know whether it's like instructionals or DVDs or, or something like that. But Because you get to a point where even if you retire and you're a 10-time world champion, people will stop wanting to have seminars with you, you know, eventually. And you'll probably also stop wanting to like travel to around and do all that seminars. sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually I listened to uh, Rob Rob Whitaker's podcast yesterday. The oh, yeah, episode with, they with did Craig. with Craig Jones, yeah. and Craig Jones is you could say that at the moment he's he's one of the the top one of the best known and one of the top no gear grapplers in the world. Yeah, but definitely would be the most famous Australian competing in the world stage. Oh, for sure. And uh, and he was just talking about last year was his or the year before was his breakout year when he had a couple of massive victories and then sort of got launched into celebrity status. So he had this huge year of seminars and flying around the world and I think, you know, like, he said he did really well out of that. <clears throat> but there are, you know, he's all, he was also like, that was the most fucked year. Like, I was just on a plane the whole time and not getting sleep and it was hard yeah. to train and all those things. So it's obviously not going to be sustainable. Yeah. And, and they, they, they were saying that on the thing that, like, in a couple of years, there'll be another 26 or 27-year-old Craig Jones, yeah, and no you doubt. know, so yeah, the 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 likelihood of you getting to that is so slim. But then also the opportunity only lasts for a short uh, period, for a very it? short time. Yeah, <clears throat> because yeah, like um, that's exactly that. There'll be a day where you could have put Craig side by side with some other dude, and people will go to that other dude's seminar instead of Craig's. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's yeah, it doesn't last forever. And then even if you're one of those odd ca- like. Uh, fighters who you're so far in the stratosphere like Hodja Gracie or Marcelo Garcia right um, where you could book a seminar no matter what man they don't do seminars anymore or they charge such an absurd price that no one's like willing to pay it because they don't want to do it like it's so much effort to travel and you know and to teach and then travel back home so they go okay seminar with me I don't know whatever oh, $20,000 no one will pay that and then if someone is willing to pay it they're like oh well for 20 grand you know I'll do yeah. it right 
But um, I'll teach you an armbar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seen this one? It's yeah. called the classic armbar. Yeah. <laughs> classic armbar. Been working on it for about followed by a years. front roll. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, like anything, right? Some you you can make money, but I guess it's I mean it's hard. How much were the tickets to submit version? Fifty bones. Yeah. Yeah, decent. Like you know. Because the, the promoters need to be able to make money for the fighters to ever be able to make money. But You know what's funny? The fighters didn't get shit. They yeah, got no, no money, no, no medal. They probably no paid. Gig. There wasn't even like sponsorship. Like, oh, hey, here's a T-shirt from... They know, got whatever. nothing. They got nothing. But uh, they were also very... They didn't mind. Like I spoke yeah, to Joel yeah. and he's like, oh, it's just cool to be able to compete in that setting. And, you know, there's heaps of media around it. They had like good media team, like good videos and good photos. And then the, the athletes can leverage that and that will sort of push their branding. How about the uh, MMA fighters? I was listening to something the other day, uh, Charles Sonnen's podcast, and I think he was talking about the, uh, what's the UFC uh, house that they have, the show? Ultimate Fighter. Ultimate Fighter. He said that those guys don't get paid. For that show? They even pay for registration. I, I could imagine they wouldn't get paid for that. But that's a huge opportunity, right? To it be is. On the, yeah, it is. To be I, in that I show? Just, I just mean because that involves getting punched in the face as well as <laughs> yeah, the yeah. wrestling. Like yeah, at least yeah. for the nogi, whatever, you're not getting... Yeah, you'd think once you're in the house, there'd be a little bit of per diems or something. Maybe they give you like some a bag of protein powder or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they, make you, yeah. they make you pay rent while you're there. <laughs> yeah, 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 pretty much. Cash to Dana. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, I mean, it's well known that UFC fighters get severely underpaid. Yeah, they do. You know, what was the fight? Um, uh, what's the name of that boxer who fought Randy Couture? Uh, 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 big like, guy. Yeah, with yeah. A beard. The big, no, no, no. Oh, maybe he had a beard. I don't know. He was a big, staunch black dude. He oh, fought Randy okay. Couture, and it was like, you know, marketed as like the, you know, boxing versus MMA. And Randy Couture is not a nobody in MMA. And it was right? boxing? Yeah, yeah, this guy was just a boxer. No, no, but it was a UFC fight. Oh, no, sorry, but it was a UFC fight. I can't remember the dude's name. Um, But, like, I think, I believe he was, like, a a world champion boxer. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so it was really marketed as the the boxer versus, like, the MMA guy, Randy Couture being, like, a multiple weight division UFC champion. And, like, Randy Couture just submitted him in, like, a minute. But um, the boxer got paid, like, they think his purse was like three times or something more than Randy Couture's, you know? And it's like, ugh, yeah, man, like it's just the UFC fighters compared to boxers or whatever, it is so severely underpaid. And yes, yeah, some of them make crazy money who, I don't know, maybe they had a good lawyer negotiate their contract or whatever it is, but, you know. Well, that's the thing, right? It's the, it's the, they're playing a game there and it's like, if you are, it's the leverage and it's game. the same now with jujitsu, with in that kind of no gi sort of grappling world, where it's like if you can leverage, if you can build your brand and leverage it well, then you can, you know, like Conor McGregor, he's a he, yeah. he was the guy that did it best. You know, he just talked a lot of shit, got on a lot of fucking media, and then was able well, to a, I mean, make he's such a request. human being. Well, he is, but you know, like if you look at him in that, you know, when it was that peak stage of him having all that success and knocking out Jose Aldo and Chad Mendes and all that, man, he was like, his banter was so good. His highlight reels were so good and he was just talking it up constantly and he made huge money. Now he's become a bit of a dick and he's done all this a stupid shit. But he's a massive dick. Yeah, he's a massive bro. dick. Yeah, he's Did you see the recent yeah, one where he punched terrible. the guy in the face <laughs> in the bar? Oh, the old that guy. Was yeah, because he refused to take a <laughs> shot. Like, oh, so bad. Man, yeah. It's getting bored, I but, think. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? He kind of reached this pinnacle status and then now he's, uh, whatever, like idle hands. Like, but yeah, like, I, you know, I get it. Like, uh, it sells tickets, you know? But, uh, man, for me, like, it's just not... It's, it's not great for the image of a, of a sport or for, for, at, like, for people who are professionals, right? You know, like, I, I think Conor McGregor's a douche, but, you know, I give him full credit for the amount of work that goes in to be a professional fighter or... To just be an athlete, mm-hmm. a professional <clears throat> athlete in any sport takes a huge amount of work and dedication. But, man, it's just, for me, it's just disrespectful, you know? Like, I, under, I understand why people trash talk and I get it. And I also get, to a degree, the psychology of it in combat sports. Some people need to, like, actually believe that they hate the person to really, you know, get psyched up or whatever. 
But it's just gross, man. Like for me, the best guy was GSP. He was just always clean, professional. He always had like a suit on. First guy to wear a suit, wasn't he? Yeah, he was just like a good person, you know. And then would destroy you, you know. But like he just never like stooped to that level of having to trash talk or whatever. And okay. you gotta, you gotta have them though. Like the, the, they're always going to be around. You know, if they're all it's, and it's also it's yeah, also a drama. It's a technique, yeah, right? right? It's like. Like if like there's one GSP, so it's like if you don't have that ability, how do you stand out? You know, yeah. and what what can you leverage around you? So well, okay, I got a media team here. But I got, I'm going to talk a bunch of shit, and I'm you know, and 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 potentially there's a there's so many guys out there or girls out there with skill, but because they don't have whatever that X factor is that to just to you know to uh, to talk themselves up and and leverage those things. Um, they never become, they never reach those heights. So yeah, as much as it's like, you know, it's like it is kind of dirty on the sport and it's a whole other side of it. I, I'm also like, I also get it because there's so many good people out there now, right? You want to... Yeah, I get it too, but like why is it, why is it that it's sort of allowed, not, or not allowed, but required in combat sports? Like imagine if you were like, um, imagine if, take any other sport, like you're, oh man, like... I know you do the 100 meters faster than Usain Bolt, but you just don't have that social media presence, bro. So you don't make the Olympic team, you know? Like, <laughs> it's like, why can't it just be about, like, the, the sport? Like, you know, why does it have to be, you know, oh, I'm watching this guy fight this guy and I hate that guy. I hope he gets knocked out, you know? Why can't you just have two, like, professional athletes putting on an epic show? People love know? the backstory, though. You know, like like anything. I guess like, like your business. Uh, America's Got Talent is built on that, isn't it? Like, mm. oh, yeah, that's right. My mama hit me with a spoon. Yeah. But think yeah. about <laughs> like think about jujitsu, and I think yeah. maybe with like say Flow Grappling, which is a channel that you know like you can subscribe to it, and they show all this backstory stuff for jujitsu. Mm. But before that, you would watch jujitsu <coughs> matches, and it's just two guys, you know, two girls rolling around in their gear, and you're like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. Someone with a Brazilian name, they all sound the same. You know what I mean? Like, it's very easy to be disconnected from it. But now you can watch Flow Grappling and you can see, like, oh, here's so-and-so's, like, week of preparation leading up to the comp. And you, you see them at the cafe and training yeah. and talking. And it, it brings you in emotionally. But, yeah. a, but any, any, uh, any entertainment is, is boring if you don't understand it. You know? Like, yep. you could... Yep. Uh, a, a, a great example of that is the, the whole esports industry. You know, there's it's can uh, be in the Olympics supposedly. Let's talk really? about it. Yeah, talk about it. What e is sports? It? Extreme what sports? sports? No, 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 no. Video like, games, like entertainment oh. sports. <laughs> oh. Like what? Oh, video games. I was like, what is that? Yeah, yeah. esports, no. bro. bro. Sonic like Hedgehog, no. Street Fighter. Yeah. <laughs> like it's a, it's a multi-million <laughs> dollar industry. Yeah, it's Maybe it's billion dollars. I don't know. Like it's They're filling stadiums now, dude. It's oh, like really? so. Yeah, one yeah. How do you know? Uh, I train a couple of guys that. Uh, big on games. Yeah, well, uh, we got a to tell you the, in here as well. To, to tell you the truth, this right is. Uh, no, I'm not a gamer. No, I, are you like the board? Some board games. I used to play video games until I met my wife, and then she was just there was zero tolerance. Oh wow! <laughs> so it was like <laughs> her all the games, down. and I had to. I I got rid of my console. What was the system of choice? Well, I'm still on the video. Uh, this is this is the. I, can that you I, I can't remember the last time I wore headphones. A lot of jiu-jitsu guys like the game. Games, <laughs> 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 when are you like World of Warcraft? You're like, bro, I used to play oh, that. Gosh, that was, how'd you I, get anything done in your life? Yeah, I sunk too much time into that game. I don't play that <laughs> game anymore <laughs> at all. Um, but actually, for me, uh, the <laughs> and there's a website called. Widows of Warcraft. I don't know if anyone knows about this game, but people disappear. They get in this game and you don't see them for three years. You don't so you fucking yeah, go. Yeah. When you fight with D, do you say, I gave up, you know, I gave up video <laughs> games for you. Like, yeah. that. <laughs> nah. nah. Man, it's, it's, <laughs> if, you, if you're good at it, it can pay crazy money. Yeah, yeah but I, it's I But it's that. like some niche sports, you know, yes. like, you know, like jujitsu. You know, if you don't make it big, it's very difficult to make money in it. But one of the biggest esports um, tournaments is like the games Dota 2 and they have like their world championships, you could say, called the International. And man, like their prize money is over $20 million. You know, it's huge. What do you reckon your athletic lifespan would be in that sport? Probably about, 
you peak at 16 and then you'd be they, they on actually, the outer at 16 No, and they half. do. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, when your reaction time yeah, slows down yeah, by 0.00025 is, zero yeah. zero zero two five a second. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, big money. You my, know. my son was telling me about it because he, he, he loves Minecraft. He loves Minecraft. We hardly let him play. He gets an hour on Saturday, an hour on Sunday on he's computers. Like, but Dad, yeah. I'm going to be a pro gamer. Well, <laughs> no, he's telling me how um, someone won ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars playing Minecraft. I was like, what? <laughs> I can't believe you're <laughs> telling me this now. Yeah, because he's not even seven. I'm like, oh, we moly. get the yeah. <laughs> Get outside. You're banned yeah. from inside for the next hour. There's like a 16-year-old that won like a Fortnite competition recently in the US. Won like, I think, a million dollars or something. You know? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. The 16-year-olds making more than that as YouTube stars too, right? Yeah, right. You can make a lot. Right? Crazy fucking world. Yeah. yeah. Bro, yeah. I wanted to... Um, we are talking just before about the, the pro athlete thing. And I wanted to... What I find interesting about jiu-jitsu is that um, because it's not a... It's not really a professional sport. Like, there's no, you know, you can't really get paid to do it on any sort of consistent or long term basis. Um, but it's now crossing into a place where there are people who kind of, who are almost professional in that their life is dedicated to it. They don't work. They have, I guess, sponsorship money or, yeah. you know, trust funds or whatever. Um, could you talk on that? on how that works because say you just competed at the the comp in Vegas the yeah. Masters Worlds yeah. and I'm guessing there would have been some people in that competition who would almost be professional athletes but then you're a guy who's running your own gym you, you're you a father you've just you, you know your son's been born he's not he's not one yet is he? No he's almost six months Okay so you know you got a lot of shit on your plate and then you go and do this comp as well Yeah um, I mean it's like everyone has their own sort of like struggles to to compete but like a lot of professional athletes to make that breakthrough they off whether it's like me who's got their own gym and a baby and whatever uh you know they can often be working like four jobs and sleeping on the the floor of the gym until they make it you know until they then get those those sponsorship deals but even like some of the big guys man who are sponsored in that they don't get a lot of money. Like, you know, I I did some, like, uh, sponsorship negotiations for back when... Um, back when Lucas Lepre was sponsored by Storm for a short period of time. And I did some of, like, the... Like, looked over his contract and stuff he's, like that. He's one of the greatest ever at lightweight. He is the greatest lightweight the greatest of all light. time. Yeah, yeah. Um, now he's now with Showy Roll. He wasn't with Storm for very long, and like, yeah, like he gets free keys, but like the salary, so to speak, that they pay him, like, like it's nothing. Like you can't. They're not. It's not like tens of thousands of. You dollars. can't. You can't do anything with it. Yeah. You know, like it's such. I can't remember what it was, but like it's pretty insignificant. It's more or less like a token gesture. So even some of these big guys, man, like their sponsors aren't giving them much. Like they may be, oh, we'll pay for your flight and accommodation for this competition, you know. Yeah. they, I, Some guys get quite a bit, like Cobrinha's the guy from Storm definitely like gets a, a good chunk of change, but it's not by any means a salary. So everyone, everyone who's at these competitions competing... Got side hustle. They've, they've got something, you know. Um, I guess it's a bit different if you're younger, which... You're not going to have it the Masters because it's for people over 30. But, like, if you're just a young kid, like, early 20s or something, you know, it can be... It can. Some people are fortunate where they've just got mum and dad paying for everything and all they do is train, you know. But then you also do have people who, yeah, are working multiple jobs and still finding the time and just, you know, training three, four times a day. So the Abu Dhabis... Mm. <coughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. This is this is the worlds. Is that, is that the same thing? No, no. no. So, well, so you went to the worlds, uh, the, well, the, 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 the Masters world. Masters. So you, so the worlds or like the Mundial that that people refer to is like the adults' worlds. Um, so that's up until 30 years old. You can be over 30 and register for for the adult worlds, right? Like plenty of people do. Um, but then the Masters, 
which is like the worlds for people over 30. So in jiu-jitsu, like once you get above the kids and teenagers category, that's adult until 30 and then master's divisions go in five-year brackets. So 30 to 35, 35 to 40 and so on. Because, I mean, some people start jiu-jitsu when they're mid-40s and maybe he still wants to be a world champion at black belt or something, you know. Maybe he's 55, 60 years old by the time he gets his black belt. Man, he can't go compete with an 18-year-old, mm. you know. So, um, you know, so he's got this place where he can become a world champion, but it's like a, it's a master's world champion. So it's I love not how sports do that, all sports. Do that? Do do all sports do that? Yeah, Mostly, there's, there's yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah, right. masters I mean, for well, boxing. Ma- I mean, masters, masters for division, rugby. Masters division now is highly competitive, right? I think I back mean, in, in the jiu jitsu is crazy competitive. Yeah. Like, but even in CrossFit and stuff, I think you know when you compare the scores, it's not because people in their thirties, early forties, like up into their fifties, are still like physically like developing and yeah. You know. I mean, well, you look at like um, you know, Cabrinha when he was like 38, so technically Masters 2, like was still winning the adult world championships, right? And even now, like you you go compete at the Masters and you'll be like, I don't know, whoever's across from you and you're like, motherfucker, this guy was like a four-time adult world champion when he was mid-20s and now he's early like 30s. Like a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah like a few years yeah, ago. Yeah. Or you sometimes have guys who, because the, the adult Masters, uh, the, the adult worlds are at the end of May, and then the Masters at the end of August. Man, you sometimes get dudes who just won the adult worlds, but they're over 30 years old, but they still registered, competed at adult, won, and then they register and fight the Masters. And you're like, bro, you just Holy won. Holy shit. And, you know, so I mean, like being in the weight category like yours? Because you're a heavy guy. Yeah. I'm guessing there would be dudes uh, in that weight category that are just jacked. Like, is there, Do they test? You test uh, not at not at masters. I mean, they test at the big. Because um, uh, you'd get a pretty decent advantage in Man, grappling ev- if you're on like the gear. Everyone's on the gear in jujitsu. Eh? Everyone's <laughs> on the gear. Everyone's <laughs> on the gear. <laughs> it doesn't eh? surprise me. Dude, I mean, Diaz yeah, if you're not getting, if you're yeah. not getting <laughs> tested and you're yeah. after, and you're in a combat sport. Oh, man, they're, they're it's all, very, very they're tempting. They're all on the juice. Hey? <laughs> like you see, you see guys in very ju- tempting. You s- <laughs> yeah. I mean, I might just, so where do you sign up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. Like you see guys in jujitsu who are <laughs> man, who are more ripped and like and jacked than bodybuilders, and you're like, well, <laughs> this guy dedicates his whole time to building muscle, and you dedicate all your time to jujitsu and some strength work or whatever, but you're more jacked. It's going to pass around a photo right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my Lord. We're just looking at some two they, they're very, on, very, they're, very they're, huge individuals. Lucas Barboza. Yeah. You have to roll with guys like that? No. but no, that, would be masters uh, now, wouldn't he? Uh, yeah. If you wanted to be. Yeah, yeah, for like, sure. Fighting something Man, those two dudes, they're not, they're not tall and they're, they would be my weight. They're, oh, they're, wow. they're huge. <laughs> you know, and like they're more, more developed than bodybuilders. And if you, you know, Joey and I have spoken about this, like it's very hard to put on muscle in jiu-jitsu because you, if you train a lot and like, like professional jiu-jitsu athletes do, they probably spend minimum Calvary. three hours a day on the mats. Like the amount calories. of calories you burn is crazy. Like you guys know you've rolled. Like mm. it's like you burn a lot of calories, and to put on like kilos of muscle cleanly, oh, it's fucking hard. I mean, like even if you don't do anything but bodybuild, like putting on muscle it's is incredibly not hard. Easy. Mm. It's not an easy thing to do, right? Yeah. And um, look, and don't get me wrong. Even on the juice, it's not easy to do. You still have to do the work, right? You know, like I don't know a lot about about um, about doping, but I know that it's not just like you take steroids and get muscle like huge. It mm. just helps mm. your recovery time. You still have to go work out, you know. Mm. But um, yeah, right. my weight I fight at ninety five kilos, so um, but I'm quite tall. Like I'm six four, but I'm definitely like usually tall for my division. So I get like shorter, jacked dudes, and um, they're very very strong. <laughs> guys like me. Yeah, guys like me. <laughs> Bro, I'm last, more jacked. <laughs> last, last night when we were rolling, Joey and I usually wear spats, like they're the tight leggings in jiu-jitsu. Joey didn't have his spats on last night. 
just like intimidated by his quads. I was like, I've got quads <laughs> in my face. <laughs> Get away. I got my little chicken legs, you know. I can't <laughs> squat my own body weight. It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even some of the littler dudes like um like uh was it Paolo Meow or Joao Meow? These are like tiny little 66 kilo guys, like quite sort of skinny. Like you got busted for doping. So going back to what you're saying about testing, is, um, they don't test at the Masters. Um, but at, at like adult worlds, they, they test, but it's only if you podium. So right. even then, so uh, I mean, you've got to understand as well, like it's, it's not a sport that is that has the money to uh, just randomly drug test yeah, people it's and quite everything, isn't you know? know? It's yeah, lot, like hey. that's cause like I don't have no idea what it costs. To, but you're still paying like a lab technician or whatever to run tests and all this stuff. Like it's not cheap, you know. So they only test if you if you podium. And heaps of people have lost their their titles. Um, but it's also as well like it's the the tests don't come out until months after. So like people will still be like. Like this he's dude was gained all of world the champion. Status. He's already gained the status. Twenty seminars, all seminars done. and everything. And then nine Paid months. Full. Yeah. And then nine months later, it, you know, I found out mm. he was doping. He's like, I just need you to pay this invoice within like thirty days. Can you do that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, they're just. And I saw it heaps in Brazil too, man. Like they're just. Like, yeah, I, like there's no other way to say it besides like everyone's on the juice, bro. Like, like, cultural. It's yeah, yeah, perhaps. Also, Talented. too, like uh, and this, in the states. I wanted to ask you about like injury management. I know you've had, a, you know, obviously your fair share of, the, of injuries over the years. But like with jujitsu, you know, talking about like these high level competitors, you can see them in competition having like someone say attacking a knee bar and you can see their knee like tearing to pieces and they won't tap and they'll continue the match and, and maybe edge out a win. And obviously they'll like hobble off the mats. But then, like two weeks, three later, months later, they, they're back they're in competing. the game. They got another super fight, and you're like, "How the fuck does a grown like does an adult, yeah, who's like just torn multiple ligaments, recover?" Yeah, it's yeah, it's funny, eh? Because yeah, like I've had. Do you two, think that's do- like you? Well, well, I feel like for it, the from it that could recovery be ass- aspect, it could be it's good, yeah, I mean, <laughs> 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 well, it could be some of that magic water that you know coaches in in when a football player like is in soccer takes a dive <laughs> and he runs yeah. over, puts some water on his <laughs> knee. And he's like, oh, it's good now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like I mean, I've had I've had two knee surgeries from jiu-jitsu and each one took me like uh like nine months to recover um and i know people who have had the same surgery and not had any drugs and they've come back much quicker but yeah you if you've got like a 19 year old bro kid could break his arm and he'll be back a week later you know because he's 19 but you do see these guys like like leandro Lowe and stuff who aren't young anymore you know like they're they're late 20s early 30s or whatever and you know, you guys know, like, the recovery isn't the same as it was. It, it is, like, I remember when I was early 20s and people go, oh, when I was your age, and you're like, yeah, you're just a pussy, you know? But then, like, it is once you get late, like, 20s, it, early, yeah, <laughs> late 20s, early 30s, like, you do, it's a very easy, like, definable difference at how long it takes you to recover from stuff. And, um, yeah, it doesn't make sense when you see someone who is, uh, who, yeah, has their knee ripped apart, or even it might be publicly known, oh, Tori's ACL. And then like a month later, he's competing. And you're like, what, like, what magical surgeon or what, what did you have, you know? What was your rehab program? Yeah, what was your, your crazy rehab program? And Because they, they don't have the money like some UFC fighters or something would have. Or, or professional sports teams. Like, I mean, the if you were... The physios and the rehab. And yeah, the, yeah, like if you were Neymar or and you tore your ACL playing a game, like, bro, you're on, like, a multi-million dollar salary. You've got a team who needs you to play. You're going to have the best of everyone working to get you back on the field. But jiu-jitsu guys don't have that, you know? Yeah. Like, I've seen countless, like, GoFundMes when, a, when <laughs> like, a blue belt jiu-jitsu guy tears, like, something. Oh, GoFundMe for so-and-so to have his meniscus repaired. <laughs> Fuck you, bro. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I'm not funding your surgery, you know? Like, it's just... But yeah, saving up for my own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they bounce back super quick. Like, and you've got to, it, it begs the question, like, you know, how? 
How do you feel about that, like going into a comp knowing that your competitor could, could have that? that edge on you and it, you know if you're looking at someone you're like Jeez, I think guys. like I think uh, you know does it intimidate for, you at all because I, I think like if I looked at one of those guys in that picture and I had to compete against one of them I'd, I'd be pretty damn scared Fuck yeah. I'd shit myself yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to do it well I mean <laughs> yeah that's why I don't wear white gis it's very easy to see when you shit yourself <laughs> wearing a white gi. Um, no like I mean for me personally, it's not a huge factor because um, as much as when I when I was younger and first got into jujitsu, like I, I you know I wanted to to be a world champion and all that, and it just it didn't work out for me. So I didn't um, I didn't make it to that that top tier of competitors. So as a result, I'm not competing against those guys in that photo. Um, so it's kind of ir- irrelevant for me. I'm not fighting those guys. And if I am, if for some reason they fall in my category, that's not going to be the defining factor that would result in the win or the loss. I think it's, it, it only becomes relevant when you're at the top, you know, because uh, it's any minute advantage can yes. be what makes the difference. You know, the same way that a Formula One car, if they can make it three grams lighter, they will because that 0.0001 second off a lap time makes a difference when yeah. you're at the elite of the elite. Yeah. And so um, it's, it's not like it's not possible to win the world's being clean. I know heaps of guys who have, you know, and so maybe for them... They, they find it a bit intimidating, but, um, but I think that's the only place it really makes a difference, you know, when you're in the final at the, the adult worlds or something where, mm. you know, it can be the smallest difference is what, what can result in winning or losing. Can I ask you a question? Because um, one of the standout things about you, your story and your history is the fact that you went to Brazil and you lived there. And did you meet your wife there? No, we met over here first and then moved moved to okay. Canada and then Brazil yeah well you train there and stuff and I haven't I've been to Brazil I haven't trained jiu-jitsu there you've been there and trained jiu-jitsu there and I guess a lot of people look towards Brazil as this place is very intimidating for people what was it like those years you like training in Brazil and like how did the, the gyms there are they different to here um and like what is there something an advantage that you think that you got from there or what did you learn there that you don't see that you get here if anything I, yeah i think uh you know currently the for sure the best gyms in the world are in brazil and the us um and we're getting they're getting good over here especially with some guys making it big like craig and, and levi and stuff um uh locky and all those guys really starting to to elevate the the competitive level in australia but um the way i explain it to people who don't train jiu-jitsu is i say well imagine jiu-jitsu gyms are universities like i went to harvard you know like that i really went out of my way to go to the best gym and Mm -hmm. when i first moved over there like it 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 was hard you know Uh, i didn't speak portuguese at the time and it was not gringo friendly at all when i first arrived there it was still you know in the time of like we had the internet and everything but it wasn't as sort of social media e as it is now so um as a result it wasn't as global if you know what i mean like we weren't interacting with foreigners as much so there was only me and one other guy um who lived there as foreigners and um we weren't well (laughs) we weren't very well received at all you know um tourists who came through were really well received but us living there and training there full time we were sort of seen as like you know man you're not allowed to like learn imposters right yeah Yeah. um it probably took like four years of just grinding it out until people were like yeah i guess you're cool you know (laughs) (laughs) Um, this is sao paulo hey yeah, yeah dangerous there um, I never had you any... You must have some good stories, like I gym never, ones and otherwise. No, I mean, the only time... I never had any... any I never got, like, robbed or anything kidnapped. in Brazil. No. For kidnapping. Kidnapping. <laughs> no. Yeah, there is. It's, I mean, for sure, it's dangerous. And I guess what makes it dangerous is, like, bad shit happens anywhere. Like, of course, there's definitely areas and suburbs that you avoid. But a lot of, like, the, the, the robberies... Um, 
happen in the nicer areas because the the, That's where the people, tourists are. Well, and it's where more people have money, money, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. so like the poor people come to the the nice areas. And the other thing that's dodgy, and particularly in in Rio is a good example, is that, um, you know, to get from one nice neighbourhood to another nice neighbourhood, you have to go like through or past a really dodgy area so like so bad shit can happen anywhere but i i I mean i i never yeah got mugged or or anything um but it was definitely more intimidating in the beginning when like you don't speak the (coughs) language and you know and i was always just catching the bus and whatever by myself and on the street and everything um you you speak it now yeah, yeah yeah so i speak portuguese now but um i had one time i was on my way home from the gym and it was maybe like 10.30 at night. And a nice neighbourhood. And I'm crossing the road to get to the bus stop. And this car stops to let me cross, even though like it's not green for me to cross, which is weird. Like that doesn't happen in, in, in Brazil. <laughs> I was like, okay, thanks. And I, I crossed the road. And my Portuguese still wasn't super great at this stage. Like it was good, but kind of at a level where if someone like change the subject or something like or maybe i would understand words but not in that context i'll be like oh i know what that means but in this scenario like maybe it means something else you know like is Mm. it slang or whatever and so i I cross the road and then this guy like yells out from his car like oh hey man how do i get to the city and i was like oh it's that way and then he's like blah 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 the the city i was like yeah yeah yeah, man it's uh, i don't know how but it's that way He's like, come here. And I'd already crossed the road. And I was like, uh, all right. So I crossed back over the road, which probably I shouldn't have done that, right? Because this dude in his car by himself. And I walk over and like the first thing I do is like kind of like make sure like he's not going to pull out a gun on me. Like what would I have done if he did anyway? Like, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forward roll. Ste- <laughs> Steven Seagal, wrist lock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go back to my hap keto days. You know? <laughs> Uh, and then, like, it was really weird. Like, he put his hand out the window mm. to shake my hand. And I was like, that's weird. Shook his hand. And then he was like, he was like, hey, bro, you want to go for a ride? And, like, I... So, like, I understood the words. But in the context of, like, asking directions, I was like, I was like, uh, <laughs> no? With, like, a question mark. <laughs> It's like, you sure you, do, you don't want to go for a little ride, bro? <laughs> I, don't know why, I don't know why he's got a Kiwi yeah, accent. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm good. And he's like, oh, that's a shame because you're so beautiful. And I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, thanks, man. <laughs> and like, I just walked off and I got on the cross back over the road and got on the bus and I was just like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't until like 10 minutes later. I was like, oh, man, that guy was trying to pick me up. <laughs> but yeah, so I've never been mugged, but I had some random dude try to take, take me for a gang rape or something. <laughs> <laughs> could have been the best night of your yeah, life. Yeah, right? could have been. Maybe yeah. I missed out, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, but um, but I did. I thoroughly did not enjoy living there. You know, there's lots of beautiful places in Brazil and beautiful um, people in Brazil, and there's lots of good things like the obviously the jujitsu, the food, the um, the, the culture itself is, is very similar to Australia in terms of just the way people interact. You know, really I, the biggest cultural difference, um, obviously besides language and whatever, is that Brazil's a much more religious country than, than Australia. Um, but, like, it's, I lived in not, not a... Man, like, Sao Paulo is just a hard city, you know? Like, even if you have money, it's hard, like, and... It's landlocked, isn't it? Full yeah, of pollution. And yeah, and, business like... Business centre. It goes forever, right? Yeah, and it's huge. It's dirty, and it's, like, it's, it's just gross, man. It's traffic like, like a motherfucker. Hectic traffic. I only lived 5Ks from the gym, and sometimes it would take me an hour and a half to get there, you know? Whoa. Like, sometimes you'd be on the bus and be like, I could just get off and walk. You know, but then you'd be like, if I get off and walk, some dude's gonna try to pick, pick me <laughs> up. I stay, I stay on the bus. You know? um, but yeah, so it was hard. Like I, I, I didn't quite enjoy living there. But the the jujitsu was obviously phenomenal. You know, like I learned more. Like like I said, it was like being at Harvard. You know, like I had ev- every day I was on the mats with with not only my coach Fabio, but like yeah, Michael Lange, Bernardo Faria, Leon Nogueira. Sejimorais, uh, 
Lucas Lepri and Malfa and Marcelo and Cabrinha, they had already left and were living in the US, but like other, like Gabby Garcia, Luana Alzaguirre, Tarsus Humphreys. So like it's all of the, the stock that you're rolling with as well as like the culture in there. They go a bit harder or the more disciplined. Super hard. So, so like They're more living it a lot more you, intensely. Yeah. So like um, for the first chunk of my time there, like before I sort of like ran out of money and had to teach English uh, to pay my way, in the beginning I sort of did a good nine, 12 months of like just training, like no work. And so I would train from like seven till nine in the morning and then I would stay at the gym and like eat and have a nap or something. And then I would train again from 11 till two. And that that um, midday training was the competition class. And like it was, so it was only blue belts and up and it was just like stacked with with like blue belt world champions, purple belt world champions, brown, black belt world champions. And because it was a competition class, like it wasn't like everyone in there is com competitive and so it wasn't super friendly like even the people who were friendly when they were rolling it wasn't friendly you know like you wouldn't want to give an inch in the rolls and me being a big dude i was always lumped in with the big guys like when i first moved there i was a, a blue belt yeah and back then i was probably you know a very light 90 kilos and like fabio would be like all right guys uh Groups of three, and he'd be like, Lel, Lel's like a, a, a black belt world champion plus 100 kilos. He'd be like, Lel, Bernardo, Bernardo as well as the guy from BJJ Fanatics, uh, again, like 100 kilo black belt world champion. Lel, Bernardo, and uh, <laughs> Adam. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> what the fuck? What? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, he would always put me you in got the, that gang rape. <laughs> oh, man. And, like, they Should have gotten that fucking car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And they would just Far murder out. me, like murder me. Uh, like some days I left the gym like, you know, like pretty much crying, hey. Like, yeah. Because as, as well, when you're someone who's chosen jujitsu as your career, um, like some of the days were hard, man. Like when you're physically and emotionally just beaten. But, um, but for me, it was great. And one of the things that um, made, made and makes... Fabio, such a good coach, and it's something that I try to emulate, is um, he's very good at, at how he teaches each individual student. And what I mean by that is he doesn't just have his one way of, of teaching. Um, you know, like if you think about it like a personal trainer, right? So some personal trainers are that guy who's like, come on, you maggot, like, um, piece of shit, go. And some people like that in a personal trainer. Like some people, like they want a personal trainer who like kind of treats them like a dick during the training sessions. Like they, they need that. And then some personal trainers are like, you know, oh, come on, bro, you can do it. Okay, rest this one and then the next one. I believe in you, blah, blah, blah. And some people prefer that type of trainer right but mm. fabio is good at doing all of that you know um so he's good at assessing that individual student and knowing mm. what is how do i need to approach this student to get the most out of them if i call this guy a piece of shit you're weak blah 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 is he going to cancel his membership or is he going to come back stronger and that's what makes him so good like this like one of my, one of my favorite stories with fabio was um we were training and it was uh, before he had air conditioning in his gym. It was the middle of summer. The, the water bubbler was broken, so there was no water because you can't drink tap water in Brazil or it's not advisable anyway. And um, it was like the, the gym was packed, so it was like a sauna. It was so hot and it was like the last round. So I'd already trained like all day and I'm going with Fabio and Fabio is known for his top pressure. Like he's a... a I mean, now he's a bit lighter, but he was always like sort of 90, 95 kilos, like shorter, like super strong dude, always been known for his top heavy pressure. And um, I was full mount on the bottom, obviously just getting crushed by him. I think I was only a blue belt at the time. And he had me in what's called like a Superman armbar because your arms like extended above your head like <laughs> Superman <laughs> flying along. And he had the armbar, but he hadn't fully hyperextended my elbow yet. But I was just suffocating. Like I was already like, like tired just because of the training, but hot, everything. And, um, and like his geese all over my face. And, um, 
And I was, I felt like I was just going to pass out just from like the, even though he wasn't like choking me, I was suffocating. So I tapped and man, like he got off and he, he was just like, in, in Portuguese, obviously he's like, you fucking tapped before. Like I put on the submission that makes a weak soul. Don't you ever fucking do that again. The next time you do that, I won't let go of your arm. Fucking pussy, blah, blah, blah. And then starts like, you know, like, man, the look of disappointment and shock on his face. And then, like, oh. he's turning to the other black belts. Fucking Adam did this, blah, blah, blah. Just, like, right in front of me, just, like, riding me off. And, like, man, I, I left the gym just, like, so broken. So broken. But yeah, then I came yeah. back the next day. And then um, one of his other black belts had me in the exact same position. And I was like, I am not fucking tapping until I either get out or you get the submission. And so he got, he got the submission and I tapped. And then like when he got off mount and I looked and Fabio was just watching. Yeah. And I was like, you were watching, weren't you, Fabio? And he was like, yeah. And if, if you tapped early, I was going to tell him not to let go. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I mean, like, you know, for some people, they might see that story. It's like, oh, what a dick, what a bully, blah, blah, blah. But like, he's not, you know, like he... It was the that, lesson you needed. It's the lesson I needed, right? And because he doesn't treat everyone that way, you know? I've seen him be much nicer to other people who are also phenomenal jiu-jitsu athletes. Um, and so I try to emulate that too, you know? Like Fabio's definitely been... Fabio and as, was, uh, by, as well the Team Alliance have been huge for me and definitely like, you know, made my career right and it's you know what i'm trying to do now is i wanted to have that that level of jujitsu here in in sydney so coming back to to today like rem, like uh, you've seen you know there's a question for you as well joe uh, you guys have both been uh, in in a, a period where jujitsu has started in in sydney with quite a small seat and now it's it's everywhere and it's really it's almost a, a mainstream sport here. It feels like it, it is anyway. There's a lot of gyms yeah. popping up everywhere. Yeah. I'm sure the majority of the coaches haven't had the same uh, level of experience that you've had or maybe they have. Or um, no. uh, All I know is that when, when a market gets a little bit flooded, usually there's, um, there's different levels of, of gym quality. So let's say you're a white belt and you're turning up to a jiu-jitsu gym for the first time, what are, what are, the, what are the things you want to look for in a, in a good jiu-jitsu gym or academy um, yeah, here in Sydney? Like if you're already educated in jiu-jitsu, like if you've already done some training, it's a bit easier to differentiate like the, the, the good and the bad. But if, if you're new, you have no idea, right? You never like stepped you, you, in a jiu-jitsu gym before. You have before. no idea like is this technique legitimate or not, right? So to some degree you just have to rely on, um, you know, either have faith or rely on someone else's advice. But apart from that, the thing that I tell all students is like, it just needs to be the right fit. You, when you get into jujitsu, you spend so much time in the gym. If you don't enjoy the vibe, if you don't enjoy the atmosphere, if you don't enjoy um, the way that the techniques are taught or articulated, right? You're not gonna enjoy it, right? Like if it becomes a chore to come to jujitsu, right? Um, you, you, you won't stick it out. Apart from having a knowledgeable coach and it logistically making sense, it's super important to enjoy the vibe and the atmosphere of the gym. Because similar to like you guys here, uh, Jungle Brothers, like it's more than just like a strength and movement gym, you know? Like that's, that's you know, it's words you use to help describe it, but it's far more than that. Like it's such a community of like, of, um, of students that, or athletes or whatever you want to call it that you have here, like, and all the events and everything that come along with it, right? And I'm sure, you know, um, there's perhaps some people who, you know, want that and some that don't. And it's the same for jiu-jitsu. Like, I honestly believe that in Sydney, I have the most to offer out of any, other, any jiu-jitsu gym in Sydney, you know? Like, there's no other gym in Sydney that where the instructor has the experience that I've got. But at the same time, there's some people who aren't going to buy what I'm selling, right? Um, and, and I'm okay with that, you know? Uh, so I think it's super important to, like, make sure that you feel like, like you fit in, 
right? Because otherwise you, you, you won't enjoy it. It's different if you're doing something like I did where, where I moved to Brazil for, like I said, like it was like five years of university for me. Like a lot of the time it sucked, but it was like a sacrifice I was making, you know, because I was going to Harvard, right? But if you're just like an average person who's training for average reasons, like the majority of people who do jiu-jitsu are, man, like you've got you to gotta enjoy the vibe. I think it's Fun super, super culture. Yeah, mm, I think good it's advice. good advice. I think yeah. it's super important. I think too, like looking back on my my own jiu-jitsu experience, the um, I can see huge, like I can see a huge section of my jiu-jitsu life where I just didn't learn anything. Yeah, and it was you know put it down to um, the coach was a bit tired over that period or was a bit disengaged with the the whole you know business he was running or whatever it was. But I just didn't didn't get any better, and I was doing stuff, and and for a lot of that time I was kind of not enjoying it. But it was going back to this thing of like I'd been with him for so long, and I felt, you know, I was there were my teammates at that gym, and I felt kind of pressured, or it was you know it was an obligation to to stay committed there. But then I, I've been training with ads for like must have been like almost, over a year and a half, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just over a year. It wasn't long after I opened that you started. But I can like I can I can like from the first day I started training with you, I've been developing. Like I, it's just, I, yeah. I, I, I just get, I get something new every time and I can, it's kind of black and white for me that I'm like, wow, like my development over the last year has been exponentially greater than my development in the six years prior. Yeah, well, because it's like what we were saying before, like before, um, before we, we jumped on the podcast that, you know, um, some people just, like, you just don't know until you go somewhere else, you know? Like, it's like when you're, when you're a kid and you think your mum and dad's cooking is amazing and then you grow up and you go to a restaurant and you're like, oh, salt, you know? <laughs> like, and you're, you know, okay, like, some parents are great cooks, but, you know, you know what I mean? Like, because you don't know any better, right? You have, you've never been to a good gym. You've never been to, like, a, a good articulate instructor, you know, um, and, and again, super similar in, in my gym to what you guys have here. Like I've seen your classes. I've done some of your classes. You guys are all very articulate and concise. And it's not just about being knowledgeable, right? Like you, ha you, how do you get that information into the person's head, right? Like and there's ways you do it. And jujitsu, there's ways you teach certain techniques and there's reasons behind it. It's not just like, oh, teach this because it's fully sick, you know? Like and... Um, and people, people don't know. Unfortunately, re the reality is like beginners don't know that, mm. right? You can just, hence why some people do the, the um, what is it? The no mind, uh, the one you're talking about that your son does. McDojo. Like people does, yeah, the, like the <laughs> McDojo <laughs> stuff because people don't know, right? But, you know, when Joey started training with me, when I first rolled with Joey, I remember I was like, oh, yeah, like he's strong. He's like a, a, an athlete, you know, very physically capable. But I was like, ah, oh, it's fine. And then, it, man, it didn't take long that Joey has now improved like cr a crazy amount. Like I said to JT, you know, I was like, man, you wait till next time you roll with Joey, bro. Like he's gotten so much better. And Joey's heard me say this a lot. But I, I said, to, I've said to Joey multiple times, man, the biggest compliment I can give you is that I regret everything I teach you. <laughs> um, you know, because, like, the, the competitor in me hates it, like, absolutely hates it, you know, but the coach in me loves it, you know, and I think that's uh, something a good coach should aspire to do is for their students to become better than them, you know. Otherwise, like, it doesn't evolve. Like, a lot of instructors just want to beat down on their students, right? It's like, no, like, I mean, if... If, if Joey submits me in a role, like for sure, the competitor in me, the, the ego in me is like, oh, man, God damn it. But like the coach in me is like, man, well, he couldn't do that a year ago, you know, and now he can. Like, yeah. you know, that so happened because of me, yeah. right? You know, and then now my younger guys who are only white or blue belts now, okay, they can't submit me yet, but I hope that they do, right? Because if they can, like, I mean, if I want to be creating world champions and I unfortunately never reached that right well if they can never beat me they're not going to go off and become world champions right so like you're just trying to give them the tools to to become that you know that's cool man uh we're gonna wrap it up there we've gone we've done over an hour and a half 
Shit. And I know that we could we could keep going. And actually, I, I want more questions. Yeah, we've got more questions. So <laughs> I think we'll do a round two, maybe uh, once the dust settles on this one. But yeah. um, you. man, thank you for taking the time to come in today. Man, thank you so much. It was awesome. Thanks. Yeah, so. we'll, um, uh, we didn't even barely touch on like that. You guys have started the ghee and the mezzanines going in and everything. So I look forward to 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 coming down once once that's all up and. Yeah, I've already, happening. I've already been hyping it with the team. We're going to get you in for a seminar. Yeah. Once the, once the mez is built, that'd be super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to see that happen. Yeah. Cool. Um, man, thanks. Thanks, fellas. Uh, guys, thanks for listening. That was episode 38, uh, JB Podcast. If you, uh, if you like that episode, please share it with a friend. Just pass it on. Say, hey, listen to this. These guys are cool. Um, and feel free to leave us any feedback if you've got stuff that you'd like to hear us talk about. We'd love to hear it. We've got to thank Panavore Cafe at Pagewood for supplying us with the delicious coffee that we're always drinking today. We're drinking it with a little bit of cream. It's just the nicest combination. Thank you, Darius. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, Panavore Cafe. And uh, if you need any help with your training, you can find us at Jungle Brothers Movement on Instagram and junglebrothers.com on the internet. Um, ads, where can people find you on Instagram? Or, um, or your gym. Yeah, so the, 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 the best place to find me is Alliance Sydney, BJJ, is the, the Instagram. My personal Instagram's kind of flying under the radar, um, mainly through the gym one. Um, otherwise, you can also just alliancesydney.com.au is the website. You can get all the information there. It's got all the links to the Facebook and the Instagram and everything. Or you can even message me on Facebook, bro. I'm around. Um, but yeah, through the gym's the best place to find me. Over in Rose Bay. Rose Bay. Nice. Yeah. All right, homie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, bro. Thank you so Thanks much, boys. Awesome.